Okay. Hello. Good afternoon, um, and welcome, everybody. Um, this is a special uh, seminar we're running on the South Australian state election. As all of you would know, South Australians go to the polls. Uh, what day is it again? Saturday. And uh, one of the things that we always do at the at Flinders University for staff and students, and this is a seminar for staff and students, so welcome all, is to kind of talk about uh, the kind of issues, talk about how the election's going to play out, and get your comments and, and feedback. In a minute, I'll introduce our kind of guests, and I'll, but I'll tell you about the format for how we want to run this. So generally speaking, uh, we're going to talk between us for about 25, 30 minutes, just to give you a flavour about some of the issues, some of the themes, what we think might happen on election night. And then the main kind of debate will be open to you. So we'll have questions uh, from the floor for about 20 minutes or so. A couple of colleagues will run some mics up. Uh, this is uh, recorded, so uh, those who are watching can get a flavour of it. So we're going to talk for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, half an hour. We'll do questions for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll take it from there. Um, what do I need else to say in terms of uh, kind of house scheme? Well, let me introduce my guests. I'll start with staff, and then we'll do our guests. So, obviously, if you don't know me, my name is Rob Manwaring. I teach politics here at Flinders University in the College of Business, Government and Law, the greatest of all the colleges. Um, <laughs> This is my colleague, Associate Professor Hayden Manning. If you don't know Hayden, Hayden is one of our long-standing um, uh, politics colleagues, uh, very well respected within the field. He's been doing commentary on South Australian politics and Australian politics for many years and brings immense experience. And lastly, but certainly no means least, our guest speaker today is Anthony Green from the ABC. Anthony is an encyclopedia on elections, political knowledge, Australian politics, and everything else in between. And it's absolutely uh, with great delight that Anthony accepted today. He's in town to do some work on the election, and he's going to talk to you all about that. So the order of play will be, I'll speak for a little bit. Anthony that will then tell you everything. And uh, the thing I'm worried about is that Anthony knows everything, and I know nothing, so he'll correct me on all my mistakes. And then Hayden's going to wrap up, and he's going to talk about some of his experiences, particularly in marginal seats. So, what, are, what was I going to talk about? So, I had some slides, which, of course, uh, I've managed to lose, uh, which is all a bit unfortunate in terms of the, uh, the session. So, I'll just speak to a few notes. My brief really was to talk about the policy differences between the parties. Do we have a genuine choice? What's on offer in terms of the policy debates at this state election? A couple of elections ago, 2010, it was a very soporific, very boring election, as I remember it. Probably the greatest difference seemed to be between the major parties... Do we build a new hospital or do we refurbish the old one? That seemed to be the major difference. This election is very different. We have a long-standing Labour government. They've been in power and office for 16 years. They are seeking uh, 20 years in office. And, of course, we have a Liberal opposition desperate to kind of break the lonely years of wilderness to kind of come into power. Added to that, we have this new fascinating factor, which is SA Best, the Nick Xenophon insurgency that's taken place. Since Nick Xenophon left, the federal parliament indicated he was re-entering South Australian uh, politics and is contesting the seat of Hartley and has unleashed a whole field of candidates. And we have what looks like a three-horse race in many, many seats. So let me say something then about some of the policy differences between them. Now, my first slide, which I can't show you, is actually from the ABC's website, which has a brilliant distillation of the main differences on the main parties in the issues of the economy, jobs, health, law and order, and so on. So if you want to look in more detail about what the parties are promising, then I refer you to the brilliant uh, ABC website uh, list. And I should also add, of course, that Anthony Green has his own election blog on South Australia, which you should have a look at as well. Um, my first question is, though, do policies matter? Do policies matter? Do, poli do people look at policies when they kind of decide who they're going to vote? Well, to some extent, we don't quite know how that works at the state level, but we do know something about how it works at the federal level. And generally speaking, uh, people say in survey responses in the Australian election study, which is the main, probably most uh, credible political science survey that's been running for years in Australia, is that policy is one of is probably the most significant determinant of their vote. Uh, but there are other factors, including leadership, uh, their view of the party as a whole, and a range of other factors. 
So policy is important to people, but it's not the only reason or the only thing that kind of can, the factor that can shape or determine somebody's kind of vote. So policy is important. Then I had a slide saying, well, what policies do the parties want to talk about and what do they not want to talk about? And you'll find across the kind of spectrum, some of the parties want to talk about certain things and some of them really don't want to talk about certain other things. And as you look at the election coverage, you can make up your own kind of judgment about that. So my slide, which you still can't see, basically talked about those. So the Labour Party, what do they want to talk about in terms of policy? They want to talk about energy. They want to tell you about their fantastic plans to make South Australia uh, reliant on 75% renewables by 2025. That's their big ticket item. They want to talk about the broadband, their plans to establish the internet here, and they want to talk about power and energy. These are the issues that they think are both important, but crucially will win them votes. What don't the Labour Party want to talk about and what do the Liberals want to talk about are those policy issues and legacies that are really problematic, that reflect perhaps a tired government trying to bed down a difficult policy legacy. So they don't want to talk about Oakton, they don't want to talk about health particularly, and they probably don't want to talk about TAFE given some of the controversies and problems around there. Similarly, the Liberal Party want to talk about their economic plans. Stephen Marshall wants to tell you about the tax cuts that he's offering, particularly small businesses and payroll tax. He wants to tell you about the deregulation of kind of labour hours. One of the things he said over the weekend is that we had WOMAD on, we had all these wonderful festivals and things happening in Adelaide, but no one can go shopping. And his point is that if by deregulating hours, we can encourage investment and spending, and you guys can go out and keep buying things. And he wants to talk about where the policy failures of the Labour government will be. SA Best, what do they want to talk about? Well, they want to talk about the issues that made Nick Xenophon a name. So they want to talk about pokies reform. They want to talk about their commitment to cut uh, the number of uh, pokies by 50% within five years, if I remember it. They want to talk about accountable government. One of the things that SA Best want to talk about is they fear that there's not enough transparency, there's not enough government accountability taking place. These are the things that uh, SA Best want to talk about. The failures of what they call the broken politics, and then they want to talk about uh, this. What don't SA Best want to talk about? Controversy, I don't think they want to talk about costing their policies, all of them. Some of them are costed, but some have not. Because I think this draws into a question about what Xenophon might do in the case of a home parliament, about whether they really are going to be a credible government alternative or part of a governing, governing coalition. So these are some of the issues. So you've got to pay attention to what, what is it the parties want to talk about, what do they not want to talk about. I then talked about, I uh, had a slide with the big ticket uh, items that the parties are kind of promising. I'm not really going to rehash those because I don't have those in front of me at the moment. The last thing I wanted to say before I hand over to Anthony is to say that um, one of the ways that you can judge this is by looking at a number of peak bodies or uh, NGOs, other groups, issue their own report cards on the policy positions of the number of parties. So I had some slides from the Mental Health Coalition, uh, an Environment Coalition, uh, the RAA, and SACOS will come out later this week, where what they've done is that they compare and rate the, po the party's policies on a range of issues. So you can go and have a look at the Mental Health Coalition, and what they've done is all the major parties, they've, they've uh, colour-coded and ranked their policy positions. So if you strongly believe that there should be a strong, credible mental health policy in the country, well, you could look at their report card if that might help you determine your vote. Similarly, the environmental group have ranked all the kind of key parties to say, well, who do they think has got the most, uh, the strongest sets of policies there? Unsurprisingly, the Greens do quite well out of that support, uh, kind of card. The RAA looked at motoring and issues of roads, and again, they kind of flagged some of their key project items, and they've rated... Uh, the government, the Liberals, SA Best on these kind of policies. And SACOS will this week release their own report card on, on which parties are going to do best for the community services kind of sector. So the, the key issue is there are issues that the parties want to talk about. This is potentially a game-changing election and policy debates are going to be a key part of it. And as we come to Q&A, let's talk about what you think about those kind of policies and kind of, kind of issues. 
Okay, I'll draw a line under it now, and I will kindly invite Anthony to come and speak to us and tell us. Uh, please warmly welcome Anthony Gray. <laughs> That's right. Um, thank you for turning up. It's a pleasure to talk to you all. One of the easier things I have in what I do for a living is um, I cover elections. I'm not doing all the great broad area of political science. I'm not trying to explain why people behave the way they do, why they respect authority, why they don't respect authority, why they vote against their own you know, um, objective class interest and all the sort of things that you get into in political science. I'm an election analyst and what I'm doing is looking at why people, how an election occurs and what happens when people turn up to vote and why is it so often pretty much the same as at the previous election. When I was doing first year political science, there was a little textbook we did, um, I'm not sure if it's still on the old, uh, C.D. McPherson, The Real World of Democracy. And it was all about, you know, for all the theories of what you learn about elections, it's about policy, it's about considering the alternatives and things, is in the end, when people turn up to vote, most of the time, it's a matter of whether you trust the people who are putting themselves forward as your leaders or not. And so often, what, what leaders treat as their most important thing to, to be is to always be trustworthy, to be believable, to never admit you were wrong, to never admit you've lied. You can never do that. The minute you do that, forever and a day afterwards, will people will say, but you said this in the past and you were wrong, so why are you right now? So there's this peculiar little thing about democracy, that's the way it works. When it comes down to voting, and some of you in first year will do this when you go onto the voter behaviour models, there's the, the old model, the party identification model. Most people walk into politics with a view that they support one side or other of politics. They may have inherited it from their father, they may, it may come from their social background, there may be a whole bunch of reasons, but probably two thirds of the Australian electorate will vote out turn up election after election and always vote for the same party. We know that from all the electoral studies and you just look at the, the patterns of vote across the country, it's clear that most people vote the same way they do at election after election. That's very obvious in Australia because we have compulsory voting, which means everybody turns out. In other countries with voluntary voting, at a time when one party is on the nose with their supporters, those people might not bother to turn out to vote. In Australia, they still turn out to vote and that's why we see such stable voting patterns. Um, I remember um, David Butler pointed out, as a great political scientist from Britain, pointed out that the average swing at Australian elections for the last 20 to 30 years is about 2%, like 1 in 50 people. 5% is a huge swing in Australian politics, which corresponds to 1 in 20 people changing their vote from election to election. That's a pretty small number of people. Most people are wedded to one side or the other politics, probably two-thirds, three-quarters. The next biggest group are people who are committed to one leader. They're attracted to the leader. They're softly committed to that party, but the fact that you've got a good leader will attract you towards them. And then there's the much smaller groups, people who vote on policy and people who vote on um, local issues, local candidates and the like. To a large extent, most people continue to vote the way they do as they've always done, which is what's interesting about this election is we've got a new entrant in politics. And that's the problem that Nick Xenophon's essay best has is out there in the electorate, there's a large body of people who ask long-term patterns of voting for Labour or Liberal, and you're walk walking in as a new party, and you're trying to convince people to walk away from that party. He's had to convince people to do that, and some of the opinion polling we've seen over the last few months has seen a party like SA Best come from nothing to 30%, and then go back to 19%. What you're seeing there is a pattern of voting behaviour, which is people who are switching one or the other, because they're voting against what their long-term voting pattern is. Is that once we get into the election campaign, and what we've seen is the Labour Party and the Liberal Party are out there saying to their base supporters, people who voted for them all their lives, don't wander away from us, keep voting for us. So all Nick Xenophon is doing to some extent is appealing to those people who might switch between the major parties. And he's giving them another alternative. But in the end, he's a third party in the system to win a significant number of seats he has to poll first or second in electorates. And the Labour Party's got this core base of support, you know, starts at Port Adelaide and it diminishes towards the hills. And the Liberal Party's got this core base, it's high up in the hills and it diminishes towards Port Adelaide. So there's this political geography out there. And so their vote is concentrated in seats they win. 
Nick Xenophon's support, when you look at it in the past, it doesn't have that geographic concentration. It's a bit higher up in the hill. It's a bit higher in liberal electors traditionally. But it's not strong enough that they're going to actually get more than a third of the vote in half of the electorates, which is sort of what you want to need to ever be a majority government. So they're always going to be the third party at this election. One, because their vote isn't concentrated enough. Two, because they don't have people who've been bred into voting for them. I mean, that was the problem the Australian Democrats had. They didn't breed new Australian Democrat voters. Nick Xenophon's out there, and there's a whole generation of people who've grown up with their parents voted for one party. They've picked up their party allegiances. They've learned around the half, or watching television is the more modern thing, um, who to vote for. They've picked up the attitudes of their parents, and most people start off with that. We have what looks like a class-based voting system, a Labor Party and a Liberal Party and other states, a National Party, but in many ways, it's a shadow of a class voting system. It's a memory of a class voting system from 40, 50 years ago, and it's still there in the system. You see it at the broad level across the country, but in individual voters, it's, it's, much, it's, much, it's very different from that. So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a two-party system. We're seeing an insurgent party come into the system, and they're trying to break into it. So what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing the emergence of a centre party as an alternative. Um, this isn't like Queensland, where there's been a rejection of these parties with a swing to one side, with the right, with the rise of one nation. It's not that sort of insurgency. It's not like the Greens, who do particularly well when there is a Labour government which people think hasn't been radical enough in its first term. So in 2010, at the federal election, you saw a big rise in the Green vote. There's people who supported the left of politics thought the Rudd government hadn't been radical enough. And so it's not that sort of insurgency. It's just sort of this rise up in the middle, which has happened in South Australia before. We saw it, the Australian Democrats always did best in South Australia. Maybe before them, the Liberal Democrat, the Liberal, um, sorry, the movement. Liberal Movement, which was uh, another breakaway from the Liberal Party, but a breakaway to the central. So South Australia seems to have this history of breaking away to the centre, whereas in Queensland, it always seems to be a breakaway to the right, and Victoria often seems to be a breakaway to the left. There's probably a whole thesis in historical geography there. But we have seen it occasionally. The 1990 federal election was the first election in Australian history where the major party vote fell under 80%. And there was a surge to the Australian Democrats at that election. It was a centre party. We saw it in South Australia in 1997, a surge to the Australian Democrats. Both of those elections had something, something significant. It was a government of the day which wasn't popular, but an opposition that hadn't established itself as a credible alternative government and you saw a surge to the centre. In other countries with voluntary voting or with first-past-the-post voting, you might have seen a different result. But in Australia, you see the rise of these parties somewhere in the centre when there isn't a clear case of re-elect this government or re-elect the alternatives. You see the surge to the centre and then drift back as preferences. And that's what we tend to see in these peculiar sort of contests here. So what are we seeing in this election? We're seeing a Labor government that's been in power for 16 years. The last two state governments that have been in office for 16 years, the New South Wales government in 2011, Labor government, and the Tasmanian Labor government in Tasmania in, in 2014, were both smashed. They had been in office, all the problems of history had built up and they were smashed. And the other government that lasted 14 years, five terms, was the Beatty government, Beatty and Bly government in Queensland, and that was smashed at the 2012 Queensland election and Labor only ended up with seven seats. Why isn't that happening here? Probably because the alternative hasn't established itself as the credible alternative. And that's probably Stephen Marshall and the Liberal Party's biggest difficulty is, sure, they've, they've established a case that this government's been in too long, but they haven't established themselves as an alternative, which has left room for someone like Nick Xenophon to walk onto the scene. And under full preferential voting and compulsory voting, it makes it, it's why it's so difficult to work out what's happening at this election. Who's gonna finish third in every seat? and what, what's going to happen to the preferences that go on. So I've been asked to say what I think people should be watching for on Saturday night when you're all turning on to watch me on the ABC on Saturday night <laughs> after 6 o'clock. You'll be surprised I spend the first half hour talking about the Batman by-election, but you know, there's parts of the country that care more about the Batman by-election than they do about um, South Australia, and I'm afraid that's the world outside of Adelaide. Um, <laughs> Um, there was a time when actually Adelaide was centre of the world when the RAN government in New South Wales, people would come around and say, what's Don, Don Dunstan doing on this subject? And there was a time when South Australia 
seem to be the, the engine room for new ideas, but it does seem to have rather passed, except for on energy. What are we watching for on Saturday night? Hartley, Nick Xenophon running. It's a microcosm of the state. There are three candidates. There's a sitting Liberal member, Vincent Tarsia. There's an ex labor member, Grace Portalesi. Both of them speak Italian, and I'm told that speaking Italian is a really big thing in Hartley. And then you've got Nick Xenophon, who speaks Greek, but lives in the electorate, and is running his insurgency. That electorate is going to be decided who finishes third. Whoever gets knocked out there, their preferences will elect somebody else. And as Nick Xenophon is likely to finish first or second, it's a matter of how strong the preferences flow, what's his first preference vote. So we'll be coming back to that probably every time a new polling place results comes in in Hartley. They're quite small electorates in this state. Then there's this peculiar redistribution thing that in South Australia, after every election, they redraw the boundaries to ensure the party that lost last time with the majority of the vote doesn't actually lose again next time. Five of the last six elections, I think, in South Australia, the party that got the majority of the vote didn't actually win. Um, it's part, it's a, a thing of electoral geography in this state. It also says something about the Labor Party's better on the ground campaigning. But there are four seats, Newland, Elder, Colton and Mawson, which on the new boundaries should be won by Labor, should be won by the Liberal Party, but the Liberal Party actually has to win them first. They're only notional seats. Then there's a bunch of seats in the hills, Heysen and Carvel, Finnis down around the peninsula, on the Can uh, no, it's on, um, it's moved. It's on um, Victor Harbour now. Um, and Chafee in the Riverland, which are seats where S.A. Best can finish second and potentially win on Labour preferences. So if S.A. Best is doing well, those are seats to watch. Giles and Port Adelaide, two safe Labour seats where S.A. Best has a strong chance of outpolling the Liberal Party. And they'll be interesting seats. There haven't been many seats where, where um, Labour loses to a third parties, but this election there's a couple of them, like Giles and Port Adelaide, where that's the case. Um, Flory, Morfitt and Mount Gambier, the sitting members, have resigned from their party and are recontesting as independents. If this is a really close election, the fact that those independents might be re-elected. And then there's a bunch of the more marginal seats, the traditional seats, which are swinging. And if the Liberal Party are going to win, seats like King, Hurtle Vale, Lee, Torrens, Wright, Badco, they're traditional seats on 3 to 4%, which if there's a swing from the left to the right, the sorts of elite seats the, uh, <coughs> the Liberal Party could win. And then Frome, which is a seat held by Independent based on Paul Perry, Jeff Brock. If the problem for the Labor Party is that the redistribution means they need to win seats to hold government. They need a swing of something like 3% to win again. I can't see how Labor can, <coughs> again, overcome the boundaries to win seats. And I, they've got 20 seats going into this election. I can't see the three or four seats they're going to win to end up with more seats in the Liberal Party. The question is, can the Liberal Party win enough seats to get a majority on the other on right? That is the bigger question. The better Nick Xenophon does, the harder it is for the Liberal Party to win this election in their own right. Given the Gat Labor Party's been in office for 16 years, probably their best chance and their best hope for the future is actually to lose narrowly, to end up as a, a strong opposition, a revitalised opposition against a relatively weak first-term Liberal government. Um, so that's the interesting thing to watch. If Labor was re-elected as a weak minority government, then the prospects for them in four years' time would be quite terrible, potentially, depending on how the next four years go in politics. But I'll say one other thing. State politics is increasingly dominated by federal politics. That When you have a, new, a federal government of one party or other, then every state government of that persuasion struggles. <clears throat> Since the Abbott government came to office, we've seen a first-term Liberal government defeated in Victoria, an astonishing defeat in Queensland for a first-term LNP government. Um, and the only government, well, there have been two governments since the Abbott government came to office in 2013. There's only two Conservative governments been re-elected. New South Wales in 2015, which was uh, not a hard government to get re-elected, given the state of the previous Labor government. And recently, the Hodgman government was re-elected, again, um, thanks to the, the record of the previous Labor government. So... Since 1990, there have been only two new governments elected of the same persuasion of the federal government at the time. The first was in 1995, when Bob Carr struggled to win with a one-seat majority at the same time as the Keating Labor government was still in power. And the second one was Will Hodgman four years ago in Tasmania. There's been no other governments come to, come to office as a first-term government at the same time as their party was governing federally, which is one of the problems of Stephen Marshall. One of the interesting things of this dynamic is if you said 
Who are the four people who've dominated this campaign? You'd say one would be Jay Weatherall, two would be Nick Xenophon, three would be um, Malcolm Turnbull, and whichever Liberal leader in Canberra stuck their head up on that particular day. And Stephen Marshall would probably be the, the fourth place profile of this election campaign. So he can, he's running in a, up against a federal Liberal government. He's running against a state Labor government which has been very strong in terms of its on-the-ground campaigning for the last few years. And Jay Wetherill is the longest-serving head of government in the country at the moment and is probably the canniest politician of any of the leaders around the country at the moment. And Stephen Marshall is certainly not that sort of canny a politician. So that's the difficulty the Liberals have. The new boundaries, the presence of Nick Xenophon and the fact Labor's been in power 16 years probably gives the Liberals the best chance of finishing with more seats. The difficulty for them is if they don't finish with more seats, the Labor Party coming to office in the last 15 years in different states has shown an ability to govern and manage with cross benches. Conservative parties in this country have been far, not been nearly as good at managing minority government. Minority governments coming to office have a good record of them being re-elected at subsequent governments. But all the examples of that in the last two decades, the Rand government here in 2002, Steve Brax in Victoria, Peter Beattie in Queensland, have all been Labor governments. Liberal governments coming to office as minorities do not have quite the same record. So that's the problem that Stephen Marshall is. He's probably a strong chance of ending up with the most seats, but will he be in a position to be a strong government if he doesn't get a majority? <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very, very strange for me because I love elections and I just relish the opportunity to do political commentary. I was very fortunate when I started off here 30 odd years ago to be mentored by Dean Gench. Now, not many of you know him, but if you looked in the library, you'd see the books he's written. And he really impressed upon me the need to try and help the average citizen voter understand what the hell's going on, particularly at election time. And I've tried to do that for the last 20 years. And this election, it doesn't get any better than that, than this. However, life is unpredictable, funny, odd. This is my new uniform. I wear it on the weekends. Hazel Wainwright. The more happens to be my wife. She happens to want to be a budding politician. She says she gets it done for Mawson. We workshop that slogan over many months, she can't even get a long time ago. I'm not know. a member of SAFS, heaven help me joining a party, but obviously I'm doing my best to give my theoretical advice. And I've learned often it's better to be asked for advice than to be constantly offering it. <laughs> but I am the, the hapless, <coughs> hopeful campaign manager. But I'm not doing any political commentary. I mean, it became very evident early on when I started to learn more about what was going on in the ins inside of SA Best. I couldn't get up and be objective. I just might have been a bit critical, and that might not make me too popular at home. Um, but also, as a university academic, you pride yourself on doing your damnedest to be objective and fair-minded and help people. You've got to keep out of it. So I'm not going to give any commentary today. But what I want to try to give you as he speaks, he feels the high anxiety, and it's not standing up in front of you guys speaking, it's the fact that right now free polls have been published, and I haven't seen them, in the advertiser Adelaide Now, and one in Clue Partly, and sometime, either today or tomorrow, Adelaide's, in my book, most respected journalist, Tom Richardson, who writes for In Daily, went out with Hazel last Friday, door knocking in my ponga, and he's gonna write a profile. <coughs> What's that going to be like? Helpful or not helpful? So, I want to convey what it's like if you're a candidate in a marginal seat. And I've just given you a sense of a level of unremitting anxiety because you don't know where the incoming critique, negativity is going to actually bob up at any given moment. And with social media, it's constant. So, so all of you have seen the core flutes, the banners, on the telegraph pole. I've become, as I've joked, a master apprentice now at putting them up. I never thought I would. But I also look at all the ones the other parties put up. 
And I want to impress upon you the guts and courage it takes for an individual to put their dial, their faith, up on those polls. Sure, we could debate whether we need them at all, but with compulsory voting, I think we probably do, because it actually alerts people to the fact that an election's coming. But I just want to stress that. I spoke to the Xenophon candidates um, back in January. I've spoken to candidates of other political parties. And significantly, during the campaign, I rung a number of people I know in all political parties, former students I've taught, who've run for office. And that's a common theme, the high anxiety, the sense of pressure, the sense that when you walk out into the public, you're known. And without that, we would not have the democratic experience that is an election. And in the grimmer moments when Hazel feels like, why am I doing this? That's been one of my themes, a reminder. And in fact, when I've been out putting leaflets endlessly under doormats or in letterboxes, as I joke, I'm an anthropologist now, the average doormat, to the high quality ones, to the walkway to the house and all of that, often I speak to voters, and it's really enjoyable to talk to people, and if I can get in the theme that, hey, there's more that unites us and divides us, this is a very important democratic experience, not always easy, given the antipathy people have toward government and politicians. But I just want to stress that, and in a sense say to all of you who may consider one day running for office, do it. Because without people having a crack, you don't really get the choice and the range of options that we have uniquely got in this election. So what do you do in a marginal seat? Well, first of, thing, first of all, you've got to compete with the parade of those call flutes. And any of you who've driven through Adelaide will see where there's a battlefield and then you go into a few suburbs and there's not a lot. Who lives down south in Mawson? So Aldinga, McLarendale. There's a genuine sense, is there not, that something's happening? Because every poll is cluttered with uh, core flutes. And then there are the public debates, the community forums. I've spent time trying to brief Hazel on how to do that well. She's been an elected local government councillor for a while. She's got a fair bit of experience, but still fronting up where the agenda is much wider to a whole lot of people you don't know. And you don't know who basically hates your guts out there. And there are people like that. It takes courage. She's done four of those, including one in front of 500 people at the Bocce Club in McLaren Vale, taking on a bloke that won the seat back in 2006 and has been a minister in Leon Bignall who has all the information, all the information of being a minister, all the experience of being a politician of that amount of time. Of course, he carries some baggage with the Weatherall government, but it takes courage and guts to do that. How well that's all gone, I don't know, because I couldn't go. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to be there, because there's a certain sense if you're the candidate and your husband's in the audience, you might, you, might, you might react in a certain way. So I kept out of there. All we know is, and as a campaign manager, nothing went wrong. That's your greatest fear. Something going wrong and some journalist picking <coughs> it up and then the, quite frankly, Murphy's Law, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong, has been in my head for about three months. The wheels can fall off your little campaign down in that marginal seat. So where's it stand now? Exhausted? High anxiety, frequently, perpetual anxiety all the time. We cannot wait for Saturday to see what happens. The worst day of my life looms on Sunday when I catch the ferry to Kangaroo Island to take down all of the posters, core flutes I put off if we're done like a dinner. <clears throat> I can think of nothing worse than getting up the ladder taking them down, and that would be the true of candidates across the state. It will be a happier day if there's a spring in one step. What have we seen in this little minor campaign down in Mawson? A few, a few green shoots, maybe, last week. Yes, there was a great green shoot back in early January when there was a Galaxy poll <laughs> that said Hazel had won the seat. 38% primary vote, the other two in the 20s, you're home and home. Oh, what a disaster for a campaign manager. The last thing you want is a candidate thinking I've won and there's eight weeks to go. <coughs> so one had to dampen down that spirit pretty quickly. Um, and, of course, being someone that comments endlessly on opinion polls and has wanted to comment on the opinion polls I've seen published because so many journalists, unfortunately, don't quite get how to interpret opinion polls. 
Anyway, subsequent to that, there have been a number of opinion polls that came right back to earth and showed that the Orange team were not doing nearly as well, and in fact, um, it's quite possible uh, Nick Xenophon will lose Hartley. Very sobering, very necessary. But there were a few green shoots last week. What do they mean? How do you interpret them? This is an insight in the small, minute world of um, a marginal seat campaign and the candidate and the campaign manager. 891, ABC Radio, David Bevan, one of the more respected uh, journalists, radio compares, had Leon Viner, Labor Party Mawson, Hazel's rival, on air. And toward the end of the interview, he said, words to the effect, you're being dusted up down there in Mawson, aren't you? Leon, oh, insiders are telling me Hazel Wainwright's got your measure. I didn't hear that, but Hazel rang me, she did. Has he got real information from the Labor Party? Is it polling information that says that? Green shoot number one. Green shoot number two is an odd one. Hazel slated to debate Leon Bignall and Andy Gilfillan, the Liberal candidate, on regional radio that goes to Kangaroo Island, and that's notable, because that's where the Liberal Andy Gilfillan resides. It's his heartland. Gilfillan was an O'Shoal didn't bob up to the debate. Is that a green shoot? What's that mean? What, what on earth does that mean? The other little green shoot, and I don't know what to interpret into it, just yesterday I'm heading out through McLaren Flat to park the car to go out hiking, putting leaflets under the doormats and letter boxes, and Hazel was up the road just door knock. Oh, what are those bods doing putting up more core flutes? They're purple, blue, what are these things going up? Oh, it's Big Null. What's he up to? Oh, there's no Labour logo on Big Null's multitude of new core flutes that are going up everywhere. There's Leon stands up for McLaren Flat. Leon's delivered $250,000 to the Wollongong Netball Court. Leon's done this, Leon's done that, he's done all these things. And then finally, late yesterday, I found one that said, he lives in McLaren Vale. Well, is that a sign that the polling is showing, or it's just Leon's fear, that they're losing? So at this juncture, <coughs> high anxiety, a few little green shoots, it's as hard as hell, and I don't know how many times I've said this to Hazel, to beat the major parties. Hard as hell to do it. It's rare as hen's teeth, but there's a chance. Thanks, Hayden. Okay. <laughs> also, I should say... Hayden prides himself that he thinks that his core flutes are the neatest ones that have been put up. He's been very uh, careful about how he's put up his core flutes. Um, look, we've got 15, 20 minutes if we push it for questions. So this is open to you. Uh, ask anything uh, and we will do our best to kind of give you your responses and things. I'm going to ask uh, Adam and Josh to run up mics down the aisles. Uh, we'll just take questions this side first, then maybe go there. And then we'll, um, we'll take it. If you could just keep your comments either short or your questions short, then that would be great. Uh, is he on and off? That one's on off. That one's on off. <laughs> keep yours off. So let's take, let's take some questions. Uh, let's get, let's, do you want to do a show of hands first? No, stop. Show of hands first. Who, anyone wants a question? We'll go this way. Actually, let's go. We'll go at the top and then we'll come down to. <coughs> So there's been a lot of talk today about the lower house seats, obviously, and I was just wondering um, what the opinions were on the Legislative Council, because obviously SA Best is going to possibly take a couple seats off of Labour and Liberal there, and I'm wondering how that'll affect some of the smaller parties as well. Well, there's a new um, electoral system this time, which will mean that the parties will be more rewarded for votes, um, is that the preference harvesting tactics used in the past won't apply this time. Um, if a party gets 30 per cent, what's that, 16, 24, they'll, 30 to 32 per cent, they'll get four seats. So Labor and Liberal, if they get around the 32 per cent, they're getting four seats each, which leaves three to fill. Xenophon's party, there's a strong chance they're getting two. Then you've got the Greens and the Australian Conservatives, the other, the other parties with a reasonable chance of getting elected. It really will depend on what the pattern of vote is. Um, I'd expect that Xenophon will do better in the upper house than the lower house, so I really... Um, can't say, but if it's not, it's going to be the situation where both of the major parties have significantly short of a majority in the upper house, uh, and they'll still have to continue to negotiate overall pieces of legislation. There's Christian as well at the back. Uh, where are you, Adam? Yeah. By the hand. Yeah. 
Yep. Um, thanks, guys. Um, the uh, Anthony, you mentioned about um, uh, the set, like sandbagging of marginal seats last election. So, Libs winning the popular vote, but Labor winning seats. I read the other day that the Libs have got a online uh, voter database, which they haven't used in the past. What are your opinions on that and the outcome of the election? Uh, look, a lot of people go off to look at America and they look at all these tools like that to use. Um, and they work very well in the American system where you know whether people are registered Republicans or registered Democrats or registered Independents. And much of those, those tools are most used at primary elections. Um, and they use the president, in the, you know, House of Reps elections and all the other elections that go on constantly in America under voluntary voting where the turnout might be quite low. And it has a huge impact because what you're trying to do is track down people, you're just trying to get them to vote. Under compulsory voting in Australia, these people are all going to vote anyway. So some of these tools like that, which are always talked about as being so important, um, they have huge impact in America, but I'm still convinced that in other countries where party identification is much more along traditional class lines, it's quite different. There are cross-cutting values of all sorts that underlie the American system based on race, based on class, based on religion, based on city versus country. America is a much more multifaceted party structure than most other countries, yet it has the most rigid two-party system in the world and also the weakest party system in the world. So all these tools you develop for American politics, you take them to other countries where there's much stronger identification with political parties, it's rather hard to make them work. And, and I think particularly in the Australian system with compulsory voting, I'm not convinced they work that strongly. You still have to get out there. One of the key things the Labor Party has done well in recent years is start to talk to voters again face to face, either ring them up or knocking them on the door, get the unions out and door knocking. And they've been very successful in reinvigorating that. The Liberal Party has fewer troops on the ground to do that sort of work and has to use some of these other tools to try and find other ways to make that face-to-face -face contact by targeting who they need to talk to. I'm still convinced to you to, that it really works that well. So you hear a lot about that, but there's a lot of journalists who've heard about all this stuff from America. And everybody, you know, I can't believe the number of people who talk to me, oh, that was so exciting you worked on the last American election. I did very little work on the last American election. American politics is not my specialty. I did one day's work, I did the coverage. But there are people in this country who are obsessed about American politics and they pick up on all these things and try and apply them here and they just don't work in our system in the same way. Let's take more questions. Yeah. We're running out of time. We're Right, not a very profound question, but it came into my head when Hayden talking about core flutes. <clears throat> I get the feeling that parties, uh, and individuals for that matter, must spend an enormous proportion of their resources and their labor time on putting up core flutes, most of which have nothing on them except maybe the name and a picture. Does that make sense? I have actually argued within the party I support, which is the Greens, that they ought to have a single sentence on each core flute, which points to a key policy issue. But uh, that's not the way it's run here. Do core flutes make a difference? Uh, look, in the end, uh, at the margin, a sitting member who has a name has an advantage over a candidate who knows nobody's ever heard of. People always say to me, oh, there's so much you know, demand out there to vote for independence. People will not vote for an independence if they've ever heard of them. They will vote for a candidate of a party because they know the party. Nick Xenophon's an interesting, interesting phenomena. Um, who are the successful parties, third parties that have emerged in recent times? Nick Xenophon's essay best. Palmy United Party. Pauline Hanson's One Nation. Um, Corey Bernardi's Australian Conservatives. They've got a name attached to them. So in other words, what you're getting is the emergence of parties who have the same phenomena as independents. It's built around the name of an individual. People, there are independents who've had a really big name and they do really well. But the, an independent who nobody's heard of and came out and said exactly the same stuff that Ted Mack or Bob Such or any other independent can say, if someone you'd never heard of said that, you wouldn't believe a word they said. But if they've got a reputation, you'll believe them. Um, and I think what you're seeing with, the, with new parties emerging 
is there is an important thing with that. With the Greens, they do have an image which is about the Greens rather than the name of the candidate, but they still do better when the, their leader is known. When Bob Brown was leader, they did better. The Democrats, they always did better under the leaders that were known, Don Chip, Janine Haynes, and Cheryl Kernow, than under the leaders that weren't known. All small parties, I, I wouldn't, with the possible exception of the Greens, need to have a high profile name. So uh, the names of a candidate is important. Core flutes still are important. Let's take some questions up this side. Josh, there's one behind you at the back, and then we'll come down to <coughs> the front. I'm just interested in following up the comments you've made about the Liberal Party in, in South Australia, which I agree has been um, very absent from um, the election campaign and is concerning, I suppose, in terms of their level of in, engagement um, with the community generally. But also, if, if we are to see uh, a government like that um, in the parliament, what what could we possibly expect? Because I think um, we're all a bit confused on that level. I, look, I'd say some of my comments are based on the fact I'm not from South Australia, I'm outside. Um, some of the most significant political events in South Australia in the last few years have concerned federal politics. Um, the Abbott government's indecision on submarines in partly brought down Tony Abbott as Prime Minister. And when Malcolm Turnbull became Prime Minister, he had to react to the issue with the submarines. You had the blackout down here. Uh, the federal government is running very strongly on Labor's renewable policies in other states and highlights what happened in South Australia. So for me, coming from another state, what the federal government is saying about South Australia gets far more resonance and coverage than anything that Stephen Marshall has said. So I presume it would be slightly different down here. But I haven't seen a state election campaign which has had so much federal federal issues dragged into it, uh, so much federal involvement. It's been quite a while since I've seen a federal policy issue so involved in the state election campaign. That's mainly to do with submarines, to do with um, um, protection policy, to do with you know the decline of the car industry, and also to do with um, electricity industry and what happened with the blackout down here. And the warning that the Liberal Party tried to give to everybody in other states, what will happen if Labor brings in high renewable energy targets. So there's a fair bit of federal involvement in South Australian politics. You know, in terms of what a Liberal government might be like, if it's a majority Liberal government, look, most state governments now are about, are about managerialism. It's about building the roads, building the infrastructure. Um, you see bigger swings at state elections because there's less ideological content. At federal level, there is still a clearer ideological content, uh, content to the debate, but at state level, you're there to run the buses, run the trains, build the roads, have the hospitals open, that sort of stuff. And it's one of the problems the Labor government has, is that for one day, two years ago, the entire state went black. Um, that there have been problems with the child protection industry, that you did have open, that they've had difficulty opening the new hospital. These are all things that state governments are supposed to get right. And there's a fourth term Labor government that struggled with some of those. Now, a new Labor, a new Liberal government, when it comes to office, when it has the problems for the first two years, it can just sort of say, well, that's what Labor left us. So for, you know, any new government will always have that advantage. They can always blame it on the previous administration. And one of the rules we've always had for years and years and years in Australia is that most governments get a second term. Now, that rule has been broken in recent times a couple of times, so maybe that's an, that rule is no longer as fixed as it used to be. But you know, I'd imagine if there's a new Liberal government, It'll, um, it'll have a settling in period and a honeymoon period like most of them do. Josh, there's another question down the front. Just put your hand up. <coughs> We've got a couple more minutes. Let's try and squeeze in a few more questions and then we can, uh, we'll go. Just show your hands if you can ask a question and I'll try and be fair and equitable. Thank Let's keep it quick. I still have my dad's phone. I have to do so, but do you think there'll be a result on Saturday night or do you think it'll take a few days for it to come through? Well, it does depend on what the results are. People always ask me, when will you call the election? I said, well, by 7.30, I'll either call it one way or the other or I'll be telling you we'll be here for a while. Um, by 7.30, you usually know you have a handle on what's going to happen. This, I did a Queensland election in November last year. It was very difficult on the night to work out what was going on. There were difficulties working out who was finishing first, second and third in electorates. Labor had got clearly more seats, but it was impossible to work out what was happening in the other seats. You just didn't have time to dive through it. South Australia at least has, only has half as many seats. 
And so it will be easier to go through the individual seats. But on the night, they do count some preferences. If they get the count wrong in a certain electorate, they have to do it again the next day. It may well be, we don't know. The other imponderable is, I would be surprised if the count gets above 60 to 65% in most seats because of the increase in pre-poll voting. So, um, Anthony, do you just want to explain what pre-polls are, just in case those who don't know? Um, people who vote before election day, and in most other states now, those are counted on the night. In South Australia, they can't be counted on the night. The law doesn't allow it. So with such a huge increase in pre-poll votes, it means that we'll be working on 65% counted instead of 80% counted. And on that basis, given what happened in the Fisher by-election two years ago, where the, the pre-poll vote was substantially different to the on-the-day on vote, it adds another level of uncertainty as on top of the idea of, well, who's finishing third in each seat? And what do we do with these electorates where the commissioners counted the preferences the wrong way on the night? So there's a whole bunch of things we won't know, but to be honest, um, I want to see what the votes are on the night. People are always asking me, there's too much analysis done. There's so four polls come out today. There's too much analysis done on the basis of opinion polls before the election rather than actually on the result. There was more analysis of the Turnbull government's prospects based on the opinion polls before the by-election in Benelong than there actually was on the prospects of the government after the Benelong by-election. So that would be one warning I'd give to people. I reckon we've got time for one more question. Uh, I saw one up, hand up the back. Well, let's get to Josh just behind you. You choose. Um, do you think that the Labour and Liberal government have established their policies well enough um, considering both part, considering the Liberal government, Stephen Marshall's very about attacking the Labor Party um, and saying we're tired of an old government. Do you think Stephen Marshall's established his policies well enough to kind of override that 16 years of a Labor government, or do you think he's kind of just attacked too much on the Labor government and not established a well enough policy? I don't think he has to establish his policies to some extent. Um, he just has to point to the failings of the government. I mean, you know, in the last term, the government had to completely reverse its position on setting up trial, child protection bodies and stuff like that. You know, it, it had to reverse a policy from earlier in its term. It's had the problems of the electricity industry. Was as it run the electricity in industry the right way? All the government, all an opposition has to do in some cases is point to the failings of the existing government. Um, now, I have seen situations. I remember the 2002 election here. Um, the government of the day, Rob Kerrin, ran a very successful campaign to say, why would Labor do better if they won the election? Now, Weatherall has tried to do that to the opposition, but this government's been in office twice as long as the Liberal government then, and it's much harder to convince the people to go with the government after 16 years in office. Thanks, thanks, Anthony. Um, look, obviously many of you got lectures and things to go to, but I thought just before we go, we could do our own straw poll within the uh, before we flee. So, by a show of hands, let's work out who we think the premier will be once the results are known. So, put your hand up if you think Jay Weatherall will be premier uh, in a couple of weeks. Hands up if you think Stephen Marshall will finally have broken the duck. And hands up if you think Nick Xenophon will be Premier of South Australia. <laughs> All right, there's a straw poll going. <laughs> Finally, can you just thank me in thanking Anthony and the panel for coming on today? Thank you all. Vote <laughs> early, vote often.